I wish you uh, adults, some of you did, see the faces. Oh, my God, that's what you did. <laughs> oh, no. What am I going to do? That was my prop. What happened? It popped, didn't it? Man, you know, I watched you guys' face when I came in today. Some of you, I had that balloon, and you're like, oh, a balloon! Aren't balloons fun? I love to play with balloons. Because with you can use a balloon for a decoration. You can use a balloon. How many of you guys ever play like volleyball with a balloon and hit it back and forth? Or to see how long you can keep it up in the air, bat them around it one another. Or sometimes you take the end of it and you just bop people in the head. Sometimes it, and there's some people you just want to bop in the head. I Like your brother. What? I know, and it wasn't supposed to pop yet. That was for later. But it did, and it makes me sad when my balloon pops because I, I like, Jill and I sometimes we play with balloons. We just, we just bat them back and forth at each other, and sometimes I may sneak up behind her and I may go, bam. Or have you guys ever taken a balloon and rubbed it all over your head? What happens, uh, Raylan? Your hair sticks up, doesn't it? And the balloon gets static in it, and it sticks to you. And, but you know, balloons, they, they... This is another balloon. I came prepared. <laughs> Always be prepared. And, 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 you know, can we bat this balloon around right now? I want that balloon. No. Why? Because it's not aired up. Oh, I mean, it's got to have air. Well, you know, sometimes you and I, we're like that balloon. Sometimes, <gasps> now Doc, if I pass out, you'll do CPR or whatever's necessary, right? See, so, and, and we, this is our life as a balloon, you know. Sometimes we go along and we get, well, sometimes it's called puffed up. We get puffed up because we look at ourselves and, I'm a really good baseball player. As a matter of fact, I'm not just good. I am really good. You know what? I am good looking. I, I believe I am one of the best looking men. Wait. Wait, no, 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 just, just, just calm down. I've got this. I am a trained professional. I, I... I am a good musician. The, the, the balloon! The balloon! Don't. You know, sometimes, sometimes we get ourselves, we mislead ourselves thinking we're real special. We get what's called puffed up. And this balloon, is this balloon pretty puffed up? Do you think that's pretty puffed up? Yeah, it is. Now, now, wait, wait, wait. Because sometimes we get an inflated ego. We think we're better than we really are. You know, there might be someone better looking. There might, there might be someone that's a better ball player. There might be someone that's a better preacher. There might be someone who is a better musician. You know, we keep telling ourselves that, and we get so puffed up and thinking we're so high of ourselves. <laughs> and someone comes along, and I'm sorry, baby. Someone comes along, and they kind of burst our ego, don't they? And, and sh the Bible tells us that we should be careful. Jesus warned and said that we should be careful that we don't become too proud or too puffed up because when we do, someone will come along and deflate us. What's this balloon good for now? Nothing. Well, it is good for something. Our custodian's going to have to pick up the pieces of balloon, and as long as I'm around, the custodian will always have a job. 
But there's just pieces that are left, and that's what happens to us when we get too puffed up. So next time you get to thinking you're the best athlete, that you're the best musician, that you're the best looking, that you're the... Remember, we don't want to get too puffed up because when we do, there's just pieces of us left everywhere. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today, and help us. Help us as adults by the life that we live teach these children what it means to be humble and what happens when we get too puffed up. We love you, Jesus. Thank you in your name we pray. Amen. That was a little wilder than I thought it'd be. There's a tack there. Don't let it get you. Effective. Little Blue Book, page 160. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye To Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie I am bound for the promised land I am bound for the promised land Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. O'er all those wide extended plains shines one eternal day. There God the sun forever reigns and scatters night away. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. When shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see my Father's face and in His bosom rest? I am bound for the promised land, I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me, I am bound for the promised land. One more, page 92. <coughs> I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins and won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever He sought me and bought me With His redeeming blood And He loved me ere I knew Him And all my love is due Him He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood I heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing I made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit Sums well, Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. 
I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to encourage you to turn to the book of Joel, Old Testament book, Joel. Psalm, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, or Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, and then Joel. As you're turning, a couple quick announcements. Uh, remember, no children's choir till after the first. Business meeting will be next Sunday night. Next Sunday night is also Ice Cream Sunday, the last of our summer ice cream fellowship, summer holidays. Uh, after the business meeting, we'll move right to uh, fellowship. Ladies, your Bible study, you're going to pick up in the middle of chapter 16, verse 8, 15, verse 15 through 18. Okay, I'll just, yeah, listen to them. They know. Sixteen, fifteen, ladies, guys, just let it go. Just let it, I've let it go. It's gone. And two weeks from today, this evening service, two weeks, we will be starting our revival services with Clint Sinclair. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I think we're ready for revival. There's some excitement in the air. Ladies, some of you will be getting together and talking about the emphasis in the suppers. They'll be letting you, you know about that and what the emphasis is. Be in prayer. Be very much in prayer about revival. I'm going to share with you a little bit this evening. What do we pray for when we when you say pray for revival? What do we pray for? How do we how do we pray about that? Well, I'll tell you that tonight. This morning, I want to look at the book of Joel. The theme of Joel, chapter 2, is where we'll start at. But the theme of Joel is, is actually the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. And, and when we look at the day of the Lord, I'm not texting. I have a, a, some notes on my phone, and that's what I'm looking at. When you look at the day of the Lord... It is, it's going to be a spontaneous event. It is an event that we could say happens in the perfect tense as a verb. What do I mean by that? In the past, the day of the Lord, there has been an enactment upon it. I think we're living in part of that judgment now, but yet the culmination of the final day of the Lord is yet to come. And it is a day that is to be greatly feared, and yet it is a day when I think many believers think is not going to come. Not in my lifetime. It won't be for me to worry about. And we see when we get to the book of Joel, when he talks about the coming day of the Lord, it's a warning how to escape the coming judgment. Now, Joel, as he writes this, Joel may well have been the very first of the writing prophets. Yes, even predating Isaiah, Jeremiah, those men. Because he probably, scholars believe that, that he ministered in, in Judah during the reign of King Joash, which would have been 835 to 796 B.C. We find the record of, of, of 
this king and this happening in the book of 2 Kings chapters 11 and 12 and also in 2 Chronicles 22, 23, and 24. Joash came to the throne as a young king, only seven years old. Jehoiada was the priest, his mentor, uh, and this may be why Joel does not mention the king, because he was king in the learning, in the learning of what it meant to be king, and he didn't, never mentions his name. The day of the Lord. You know, Joel, as he mentions the day of the Lord, he mentions it twice. Once in chapter 1 and, and then again in chapter 2. But understand, the day of the Lord is not a foreign principle. Matter of fact, the phrase is used often in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 2 uh, uses the day of the Lord. As a matter of fact, Isaiah chapter 2, chapter 13, Ezekiel 13 uh, and 30, Joel chapter 1, Joel chapter 2, uh, Joel chapter 3, Amos uses it also in chapter 5, Obadiah in verse 15 uses it, Zephaniah in chapter 1 and chapter 14, Zechariah, or in verse 14, Zechariah uses it at the end of his book, Malachi uses it in chapter 4, and it is not just an Old Testament principle, because many will say the day of the Lord, that was that was given as a pre, uh, precedence or what was coming from the north with the Assyrian army, from the Babylonian army, possibly from, per, or from Greece, Rome, those armies. But it is not just Old Testament, it's also New Testament. Acts chapter 2 in Peter's sermon, he talks about the day of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul mentions the day of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul mentions again the day of the Lord and the tragedy that will be. Uh, 2 Peter uses it also, and as well as Revelation. As a matter of fact, 2 Peter, Peter says this, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. Heavenly bodies will be burned up, dissolved in the earth, and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Peter, in the New Testament, knows about the day of the Lord. So when we talk about this day of the Lord, the judgment of God that is getting ready to come, to, yes, the northern kingdom in 723 B.C., yes, the southern kingdom with Sennacherib coming during the time of Hezekiah and the fall when Nebuchadnezzar comes against uh, Judah, Jerusalem particularly, with the Babylonian army. Yes, with the Romans and the Jews. But yes, for us in a day that is still to come. We have to be mindful of it. And Joel refers to this day of the Lord. So let's, let's look at the day of the Lord and what Joel says in chapter 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land trouble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is at hand. Now, as, as, as Joel is writing this, it is at hand. What he's talking about is it's literally right outside your window. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, a people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them. Even for many successive generations, a, a fire devours before them, and behind them like a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Now I want you to get a gl glimpse of that in your mind. Think of this. Picture it. When we think about the Garden of Eden, I, I, I think about lush greenery, Fruit trees everywhere. The birds that are singing. A perfect, harmonious society that is there. It's all good. 
There's no sin. There's no want. There's no need that is there. And yet he says, after this, it becomes a barren wilderness. Totally the opposite. I'm walking across the side yard the other or yesterday, as a matter of fact, and, and I see where the propane tank is at, and I literally walk, and I'm following a crack in the ground that goes all the way to the septic tank. Now, that's not very far. That's, that's probably about 60 feet. But that crack is about that big. And you know why that crack is there? There's no grass growing there. It's just dirt and that crack is open. Why? Because of the heat, because of the lack of moisture that is there. And I remember mowing that just two, three months ago when it was lush and green and thick, and now it's not. So I want you to get that picture in your mind. When we're talking about the day of the Lord coming, we are talking about something that is very severe. What's once, what once was beautiful and lush and plentiful is now a barren wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and swift steeds so that they run with the noise of chariots. Over the mountains they leap like the noise of flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people in battle array. Before them the people writhe in pain. All the faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Each one marches in formation. They do not break break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter into the windows like a thief. Now, this is just that army that's coming. The day of the Lord is at hand, and the people see Him coming, and you see the fear on their faces, and they are literally unstoppable. But now He turns to nature itself. Verse 10, The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before His army. His camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes His word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? The day of the Lord will unexpectedly strike Literally the whole universe. Yes, Joel is writing to specifically the people of Judah, but he's also speaking generally of a time that is yet to come. This term, the day of the Lord, is one that must be learned and understood by the whole entire human race. The day of the Lord rests and refers to the terrifying judgment of God Almighty that will fall on this wicked universe, both nations and individuals. But let me tell you, when we have no fear of the Lord, when we don't think God will bring judgment, we think nothing to this term, that they're the day of the Lord. But we must, as believers, we must, we must, we must take heed and embed. We must burn this phrase into our mind because there is a day that is going to come. When Jesus will return, when the day of the Lord will come, and we know that judgment is going to happen, it only remains to be seen whether we will be in heaven looking down and to see it or whether we will be here on earth and living through it. And the question I beg to answer you, ask you today is will you be ready for either one of them? What do I mean? If you're in heaven, you watch from a spectator's view. If you watch or if you are here when it happens, you'll no longer be a spectator. You will be part of that story. But we don't think about that. We don't want to think of ourselves as sinners separated from the grace or separated from God except by His grace. We don't want to think about an almighty, all-loving God who forgives sin as one that would bring judgment. We don't want to think about God sending or allowing anyone to spend an eternity in hell. But folks, I'm here to tell you the day of the Lord is real. 
The day of the Lord is going to happen. It is not just an Old Testament prophecy. You know, when you read through Joel, this second chapter, you can't read the second chapter without understanding what has just happened. Chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Hear this, you elders, and give ears, all of you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this ever happened before? Anything? Uh happened in your days or in the days of your father tell your children about it let your children tell their children and their children another generation what's he talking about a plague of locusts what the chewing locusts left the swarming locusts have eaten what the swarming locusts left the crawling locusts has eaten what the crawling locusts left the consuming locusts has eaten the land has been devastated by the plague of locust a nation has come up against my law my land strong without number he's talking about the Assyrians that are coming down their teeth are strong as a lion fangs as fierce as a fear fangs of a fierce lion he has laid waste my vine ruined my tree stripped it bare thrown it away its branches are made white lament like vir- virgins girded with sackcloth for the husband of your youth The grain offering, the drink offering have been cut off. What normally would come with the harvest, with no harvest, there is none left for an offering. The field is wasted, the land mourns, for the grain is ruined. Be ashamed, verse 11, be ashamed, you farmers, wail, you vine dressers, for the weed and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The locusts have literally wiped it out. The vine has dried up. The fig fig tree has withered. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree, the apple tree, the trees have withheld, uh, are withered, withheld fruit. Surely the joy has withered. He goes on, verse 15, Alas the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It comes as a mighty destruction. Now, we look at that in the Assyrians that are coming upon the land and the destruction that they're bringing. And we can say, Preacher, that was the day of the Lord and that was, that was a warning to those people. They need to get right with God. They need to repent and return as a theme of, of the prophets go over and over and over and over again. Absolutely true. But I want you to look at something. When you look at verse 10, 11. Look at it, the earthquakes before them. The heavens rumble, the sun and the moon grow dark, the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before His army. Isn't it amazing you can go to Revelation chapter 6 and start reading about the seals? Isn't it amazing you can listen to the trumpet, the woes that are there? Isn't it amazing you can read Revelation 16, Revelation 18, and where the Lord, where he, His voice comes in Revelation 18 when that final battle, that final army is ascended, uh, descended and come against the army of the Lord. Satan, the Antichrist, has come one last time. And you know where that battle is fought at? The battle of Armageddon. Do you know what happens? Jesus opens his mouth and the battle is over before it even started. And do you know what happens after that? The beast is thrown into the pit. Do you know what happens after that? Satan is restrained for a thousand years. Do you know what happens after that? There is a millennial reign. Do you know what happens after that? Satan is bound and thrown into the lake of fire once and forever. There is a new heaven. There is a new earth. There is a new Jerusalem. Do you know who's going to be in that? Only the saints. None of the sexually immoral will be there. None of the murderers will be there. None of the liars will be there. None of the revilers will be there. Do you know who will be there? Those who are forgiven by the grace of God. His children that have accepted. The day of the Lord is not a time that should be taken lately. The day of the Lord was at hand for the time of the people that Joel had written. The day of the Lord was for the people at the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. The day of the Lord is for us today as we live in the time that we're living in. For we see that that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night when you read second peter and he talks about the heavenly bodies will be burned and dissolved the works that are in them will be exposed isn't it amazing when he talks in verse 2 a darkness of gloominess 
A day of clouds, thick darkness like the morning clouds that spread over the mountains. Could it be when the planets collide? Could it be when the meteorites are hitting? Could it be when the stars fall from the sky the revelation prophesies about? Could it be that Joel is writing of a future time that is to come? And my answer to that is yes. Oh, preacher, you're just trying to scare us into salvation. No, I'm trying to tell you a fact. And the fact is this. It is appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. It is to be understood that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is to be understood, Scripture says, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It is to be understand that God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Christians, believers, unbelievers, unchurched, you need to understand that only if you confess with your mouth that He is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Jesus said, I will come back again. And His second coming will be nothing like His first coming. His first coming, He was rejected. He was despised. He was bruised for our iniquities. He opened not His mouth as a lamb going to the slaughter. He was, he was hung on a cross with the male factors on each side amongst the sinners. And yet, he had the ability to call 12 legions of angels and he uttered not a word. His last words on the cross were, it is finished and he gave up his ghost. It is finished his life here on earth, but he is not done. Jesus repeatedly tells us, I will be back. I am coming back. Be ready. In the book of Revelation, the theme that is there is, Behold, I come quickly. Be ready. Church, are we ready if Jesus were to come back? If the day of the Lord were to come back, where would you stand? At the judgment of the believers in 2 Corinthians 5.10? Or would you stand before the great white throne and God Almighty and the books would be open in Revelation 20. Would your name be written in the Lamb's book of life? May I tell you if you're standing before the great white throne you just as well give it up because believers will not stand before the great white throne of God. We will stand before the throne of Jesus. The ones that stand before the great white throne of judgment are only those who are not believers. And you will hear those dreaded words. Jesus said in Matthew, depart from me. I never knew you. But Lord, Lord, look what we did in your name. We fed the poor. Look, Lord, we healed. Look, Lord. And he will say, and I love it when he tells us in Matthew 25, when I was sick, you never came to see me. When I was in jail, you never came. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me a drink. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. Lord, when did we see you that way? You remember his words? Whatever you've done unto the least of these, you've done unto me. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And the bigger question that needs to be asked is not what is the day of the Lord? When is the day of the Lord? I believe the biggest question that needs to be asked is will you be ready when the day of the Lord comes? How? How will I know if I am ready? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you prayed that prayer and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Has there been an old life that has passed away? Behold, all things become new. Do you have a new life? Is there a difference in your life? You don't talk like you used to talk. You don't read. You don't look like you used to. You don't anymore. Now you are a new creation. I love it what Joel says to the people. Now therefore says the Lord in verse 12, Turn to me with your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. You know, to take and to tear your robe, your cloak, 
was a sign of mourning to show that you had sorrow that was there. But may I tell you, you can rip your garment, you can wrench your garment and still not be changed on the inside. Let me get personal if I may. You can sit here in this auditorium. You can raise your hands and say, oh, how I love Jesus. You can sing the old rugged cross. You can sing at Calvary. But may I tell you, if there's never been a time in your heart where you have prayed and asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin, you're just like the elders, you're just like the priests, you're just like the people. They had their, their eclectic, their syncretic religion. They went to the feast, they went to the temple, they heard the sermons and they walked away and they went and worshipped their gods on the outside of the church. You can come into this church. May I tell you, you can have your name written on a piece of paper, on a roll book in, in, in the church records of this building of this establishment but what counts is not what's on the records in this building but what's written on the names the Lamb's book of life is your name written there is it sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ you can read your Bible you can throw money in the offering plate you can support the mission causes when the biggest mission goes unheeded and that is your own life to Jesus Christ. Will you be ready for the day of the Lord? And let me just very quickly end with this. The day of the Lord is when Jesus will be back, when all that we have on earth will be ended. It is when you will stand in judgment and, and if you are found wanting, if you are found with your name not written in the book, please do not think it's going to be a joy Joyride. Jesus describes hell as a place of eternal darkness where people literally gnaw their tongues because it's so dark. They te he tells us that it is a place where the fire is never quenched, where the worm never dies. It's a place that you do not want to spend an eternity yet. How long is an eternity? It's as long as you can think of and one day more. You reject God here on earth, you will get your wish. If you don't need God here on earth, you won't need Him in an eternity either. The day of the Lord. Do you believe in the day of the Lord? <laughs> you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. The question is, are you ready for the day of the Lord? Are you ready? Very simply, are you ready to acknowledge Jesus as Lord, to confess Him as Lord. And when you confess Him of Lord, as Lord, that is Lord of your life. That doesn't mean the football that's getting ready to start is going to be Lord. That doesn't mean that that girl or that boy is going to be Lord of your life. That doesn't mean the job, the money, the house, the farm equipment, the cattle herd, any of that is Lord of your life. What is Lord of your life? What is number one in your life? It has to be Jesus Christ. Church needs to be the reason you miss everything else in life. Not everything else in life is the reason you miss church. Will you confess? Have you confessed him as Lord? Will you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Because the Bible says then you shall be saved. Are you ready for the day of the Lord? Let's stand. Jared, what number? 111, little blue book. Father, we thank you right now for this time and we come to you and we ask that you would be with every person here our heads are bowed our eyes are closed and we take these few moments and we look within ourselves and ask am I ready for the day of the Lord and Jesus if we answer anything but yes may we come forward today and solidify that personal relationship with you that we have nothing to fear when the day of the Lord comes let your will be done in this service. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.
sequence, if you will. I have a